Right. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Emmanuel Duplay, as Cole introduced me. Uh, I uh, recently finished an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at McGill University, where I spent almost two years working at the Interstellar Flight Experimental Research Group uh, under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Professor Andrew Higgins, who's uh, here with us today. Uh, during that time, I worked on a study uh, looking at applying laser thermal propulsion for rapid transits in the solar system, which includes a 45-day mission to Mars. Uh, you can access the uh, associated paper at the link here, although I can't click it, but uh, I'm sure we'll be posting a link in the chat at some point. And if that's not the case, you can always send me an email uh, or tweet at me uh, at the information in the bottom left. So I um, guess we'll get started. I'm gonna start by giving you some uh, context on this research and how it came about. And I, I would start with uh, in 2018, NASA solicited uh, two proposals for uh, space technologies. One of them was related to lunar habitats, if I recall correctly. And the other was related to revolutionary space propulsion technologies um, with the objective of reducing the transit time to various targets in the solar system um, by a factor you know, almost tenfold, um, motivated in part uh, in the case of Mars, in the case in the context of a, a Mars settlement, uh, at reducing the exposure to galactic cosmic rays during the transit, right? So a Mars transit typically takes six to eight months. Um, and that's actually a long time to spend in interplanetary space. You're exposed to galactic cosmic rays that increases your, your risks of cancer. And so uh, there is definitely a motivation to spend as little time as possible in between two planets uh, so that you can seek shelter on Mars um, and, and use either its surface or other means to actually protect you from uh, galactic cosmic rays once you arrive. One of the requirements that were set out in the solicitation was that these technologies should be able to traverse the distance between Earth orbit and Mars orbit in no more than 45 days. And so we took that as one of our, our, our key requirements in our mission design, but we'll get back to that later. The other uh, important part of this context is uh, the project called Breakthrough Starshot, which I'm sure some of you have already heard about. Uh, it's a concept for an interstellar mission using uh, a laser array on Earth to actually power the flight of a one meter wide light sail um, to uh, other stars, actually. So this, this laser array would be 10 kilometers in diameter, uh, be powered, you know, required 100 gigawatts of power. And with that, you can accelerate uh, such a sail to about 20% of the speed of light within only a few minutes. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because as you, you know, might have noticed, uh, the start of this presentation, uh, our research group is an interstellar flight research group. Uh, Professor Higgins has spent time with uh, Professor Lubin, who is the one of the lead investigators in this project, and uh, our group is trying to contribute to this project in any way we can, uh, whether it's bringing our en engineering skills or, or in physics. Uh, to solve a lot of the issues related to this, this project. But um, this isn't a particularly suitable project, say for mechanical engineers, which is our department. What's a lot more interesting for us is to use this laser to do other things, actually. Right, so this interstellar project uh, would require a 10 kilometer array, 100 gigawatts of power, that's, incredibly large, right? Um, and so there would be uh, an interest in finding ways to actually uh, scale up to that progressively. 
take a few intermediate steps at which we can test the technology and still do useful things with it. And this is where uh, laser thermal propulsion can come in. There are a few other directed energy concepts for propulsion, uh, but we'll focus on laser thermal for now. Uh, the idea here is that, okay, we take this 10 kilometer array and we scale it down by a thousand, both in size and in power. So you have a 10 meter laser array that's already a lot more approachable, uh, 100 megawatts of power. And with that, uh, we think we can do uh, rapid transit missions in the solar system. And because this uses a lot more thermodynamics and it's a lot closer to say a conventional spacecraft, uh, us mechanical engineers can actually uh, really do some work there. Now, the idea of laser thermal propulsion isn't completely new. Uh, it's actually been studied back in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, if you've worked in aerospace, you know that pretty much they thought of everything that you could possibly do with a rocket uh, already in the 60s and 70s. So it's not surprising that it's been thought of. But at the time, they were considering CO2 lasers and monolithic lasers because, well, that's what they had. Uh, that there was no other kind of laser. Uh, it was this big object fires a laser beam uh, at 10.6 micrometers of wavelength. And they were considering uh, launch vehicle applications mostly or near earth orbit transfer vehicles because this their, their focal focusing distance DF here uh, is actually limited, right? So because we have such a large wavelength and our focal distance is inversely proportional to it, uh, you are limited in, in the focal focusing distance that you could get. Now you can always make a bigger array, but to make, you know, a 10, even a 10 meter CO2 laser, that's a little hard to conceive like uh, in practice. So the idea was kind of dropped by the 80s uh, and not much research had been done by that, uh, beyond that point. What changed, and part of the reason why Breakthrough Starshot is a thing, is that uh, fiber optic lasers came about, uh, much cheaper laser modules that were developed mostly for the telecommunications industry, and that can be phase locked, that we can put together in a much larger array, and so you can make an arbitrarily large array for, for any mission that you want. Another uh, advantage is that we're reducing this wavelength of this laser by 10. So we're looking at one micrometer uh, wavelengths. And again, because it's inversely proportional to wavelength, the focusing distance now increases. And so now we can make a laser array that can make a 10 meter wide laser spot at up to 50,000 kilometers. That's not really a problem. So now that that's out of the way, let's talk about laser thermal propulsion and the nuts and bolts uh, related to it. So as I alluded to earlier, uh, the idea is that we send a laser beam that's 10 meter wide and uh, we have a spacecraft in orbit already that is capable of capturing this laser and focusing it inside a thrust chamber. We're sending one ton of payload and we're trying to reach Mars in 45 days. Um, the way we focus this laser is by using a, an inflatable reflector and uh, the thrust chamber is powered by a single, uh, well, it's fed with a single type of propellant. Just we have liquid hydrogen uh, that we pump into the thrust chamber and that we heat up and expand through a nozzle to get thrust. So looking closer at the thrust chamber, um, we start by injecting propellant through the outside, uh, through a, what we call a porous wall. And we'll get back to why later. Uh, we have relatively cold hydrogen at 380 Kelvin, which is then heated by a laser beam. This laser creates a hydrogen plasma core at the center of the chamber, which uh, is modeled using a laser supported combustion wave, LSC, even though there's no combustion, but uh, it's the same principles. And so this laser actually creates a, a core of hydrogen plasma that's up to 30 or 40,000 Kelvin uh, hot. This plasma core heats up the surrounding hydrogen that flows around it, giving uh, an average temperature uh, as it enters the nozzle of about 10,000 Kelvin. 
And so from that on, we just expand it through a regular nozzle. It's just like another rocket engine, but with much hotter propellant. And uh, right. And so in terms of performance, what we think we can get is up to 3,000 seconds of specific impulse. So on the right here, uh, we have plotted we have, uh, different simulations uh, for our chamber conditions. You see uh, there is on the y-axis the specific impulse, the efficiency of our rocket engine, and on the x-axis the temperature of the chamber. Uh, usually, as you increase the temperature in your thrust, uh, your rocket motor, uh, the greater your specific impulse will be. And so we've computed uh, this data for various conditions, various pressures and temperatures, and also we looked at different types of, of flow uh, in the nozzle, but I won't get into it uh, right now. And we see that at these 10,000 Kelvins that we predicted in our chamber, um, we can actually reach just over 3,000 seconds of specific impulse at best, at one bar of pressure in the thrust chamber. So with these 3,000 seconds, you feed 20 grams of hydrogen per second in the chamber, and you get six kilonewtons of thrust out of that, which isn't huge for compared to some of the chemical rocket engines, but it's more than enough for an orbital vehicle. And especially with the kind of propulsive maneuvers we're doing, uh, this can actually get us very far. One thing that's important to note is that the architecture we're looking at here for the thruster is very similar to some concepts for gas core nuclear rockets. Um, both of them actually are based on some non-solid uh, heat generator or heat transfer mechanism at the core of the rocket, which heats up a gas and expels it out of nozzle. Um, what they have in common is that, well, they have similar specific impulses and they have similar cooling challenges, right? It's also very hot in these gas core nuclear rockets. We were reaching temperatures that are even greater than uh, the ones we're seeing in laser thermal propulsion. And so we took a lot of inspiration from these designs that have been thought of, again, late 60s um, to guide our design process uh, for laser thermal propulsion. One big difference, however, from nuclear rockets is that we don't have fissile material. So we get the same performance as these nuclear engines without sending uranium into space, without sending a nuclear reactor into space. And that's actually uh, quite an advantage actually over this technology. Another key component of our spacecraft is the reflector. Uh, we need some way of capturing this laser beam emitted from Earth and focusing it into the chamber. We can't really use a lens because that would be far too heavy at the size. I mean, you need to build a 10 meter wide lens. Uh, it's, it's not very uh, doable. There are other design options available, but uh, one very obvious one is making an inflatable reflector. And uh, it actually has a lot of flight heritage because these concepts have been thought of for uh, communications. So as a large antenna, you see there's been uh, a flight tested prototype, the Lagarde inflatable antenna. Um, they've also been considered for solar thermal propulsion, which is just like laser thermal, except we use the sun as our power source, uh, but you get a lot less thrust out of that. It's, it's a lot slower. Another thing that to note is that uh, we don't need precision optics with this. Uh, we're not building the James Webb telescope. Uh, we just need actually a mirror that's good enough to create a large pocket in the thrust chamber of about a few centimeters wide, actually. And these inflatable reflectors uh, at our sizes are actually um, capable of doing that. See, there's a question in the chat. The laser array would be in near Earth orbit. No, uh, we are placing the laser array on Earth, right? on the Earth surface, just like for breakthrough starship. Um, we're building a single laser array on the surface. Right, so um, yeah, a key challenge with this reflector now is whether it can actually handle the laser power that's 
uh, that, that we're sending to it. Uh, for context, 100 megawatts of power on a 10 meter wide reflector, that's roughly equivalent to a thousand suns. Right? That's the same uh, radiative flux. So it's pretty significant. Um, based on the materials that we selected for the actual structure of the reflector, uh, we uh, found some upper limit to the temperature that we cannot exceed. Um, that's about 320 degrees Celsius. That's based on the substrate, which is a polyimide film, which is already very commonly used uh, in space applications. And we have been looking at different variations of this material, different coatings to actually allow it to handle uh, the temperatures it would experience. And that's a lot of radiative heat transfer. We're looking at the steady state temperature here based on the power input uh, to the reflector that's the 100 megawatts. And then the absorptivity of the material, uh, the size of the reflector, a few other constants, and its temperature. Um, on the mirror side, uh, we are considering some of the same materials considered for the Breakthrough Starshot project. So here again, we have a very uh, close parallel. Because the lights, the interstellar light sail also is handling uh, incredible laser fluxes, it has to be extremely reflective. And the way we can do that is by uh, stacking dielectric layers on top of each other. So uh, we are looking at titanium oxide and silicon oxide layers that if you stack enough of them, you can increase the uh, reflectiveness of that surface about as much as you want. Now, of course, you get diminishing returns and, and so on, but we can easily reach 99.5% reflectiveness. And with that, we can keep the temperature of that mirror to 230 degrees Celsius. On the canopy side, so on the transparent part of the reflector, right? So the, the, the laser enters through the canopy, reflects off the mirror, goes back through this. Um, we have twice the input power because right, the laser comes in and comes back out. Um, nevertheless, we found a type of fluorinated polyimide that uh, was very transparent uh, to the wavelength of laser that we're considering, which gives us uh, a temperature of 195 degrees Celsius. Both of these are under our limit of 320. Okay, so we have the basic components to actually build a laser thermal propulsion system. Now we then took a look at the mission design related to it. And if we can actually achieve this Mars in 45 day mission. So again, to uh, recap, we wanna send one ton of payload on a 45 day transit to Mars. Now uh, for comparison, one ton of payload that's actually very close to the total mass of the crew stage of the Mars exploration rovers. So the Spirit and Opportunity Mars rovers, their pre-entry capsule and their crew stage, all that together that weighed about a ton. So it's, it's a useful amount of payload, but it's not huge either. So here's the concept of operations of uh, such a mission. We would start on the Earth's surface, and we would launch a laser thermal propulsion system aboard, uh, say Falcon 9 could do it. It's really a matter more of uh, payload fairing volume rather than mass because we have such a, a light propulsion system. We can either send the payload with this propulsion system or we can send it separately and have it dock in orbit. Uh, once the spacecraft is docked, uh, it can actually, we can begin the laser powered uh, transmars injection, right? So we activate the laser, we point it at the spacecraft, we accelerate it out on a Mars transfer orbit, after which uh, we separate the payload and we let it go on its way to Mars while we do a second laser thermal burn to bring back the laser propulsion system back to its uh, parking orbit. Right, that way we can reuse the same propulsion system several times. We can launch a lot uh, of payload within our, our, our Mars launch window 
and also we're not losing precious you know high technology uh, propulsion we're not sending that uh, into the depth of space so our payload continues on its way to mars and once it gets there it has to slow down and what we're considering is an error capture maneuver but we'll get back to that later so again, for the departure stage of the mission, uh, we are actually considering a one hour maneuver to deliver 14 kilometers per second of Delta V. Uh, and again, for a 45 day transit. So there's another question. Be the major power source of, major source of power to generate hundred gigawatts. So hundred gigawatts, that's for the interstellar mission. We're looking at hundred megawatts here. Uh, and that's one big, nuclear power plants worth, uh, or I believe Elon Musk has built a battery farm that can provide that roughly that order of power uh, in Australia. Um, so we are definitely able to provide that kind of power. Uh, would you have to redirect it from, say, you'd have to, to, to shut down maybe a few systems in your city for an hour, possibly. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what, what 100 megawatts would require. So back to the astrodynamics. Um, yeah, 45A transit. This is the shape of our parking orbit. We've got a low periapsis, uh, high apoapsis to actually uh, allow enough dwell time in the sky uh, to do this one hour maneuver. And we've got a low periapsis just to minimize delta V requirements to actually rendezvous uh, with the propulsion system. So once we're ready to go, we okay. We can activate our laser. We can send our spacecraft onto its way to Mars. And this isn't quite to scale, but roughly this this about kind of the angle that the the laser array would sweep in the sky uh, during this maneuver. Right over one hour, it rotates a little bit on Earth. The spacecraft accelerates out. But as you can see, we only need one laser array to actually perform this. Um, this is different to say laser electric systems where I need to build several arrays on earth or some in orbit to actually do the, the long maneuvers that they require. In our case, we just need one array, 10 meters. That's all we need. It's another question. No, okay. Um, yeah, so that's the departure. And once that's done, Once that's done, okay, uh, we send our payload to Mars. So for reference, uh, Perseverance, when it launched in 2020, uh, it departed on the 30th of July and arrived six, seven months later uh, to Mars in February 18th, 2021. Uh, if we had used the same launch window for a laser thermal propelled payload, uh, we could have launched two months later on September 20th and arrived uh, one, two, three months earlier than Perseverance. Right, so we see the Perseverance trajectory is much longer. It's the typical Hoffman transfer. We're doing a much more direct route, less efficient in terms of Delta V, but it gets us there in 45 days. Now, once we get to Mars, uh, that's where things get a little dicey if they weren't already. Um, the initial NASA 2018 well, solicitation only asked that the payload traverse the Earth, the distance from Earth orbit to Mars orbit in 45 days. That's it. Said nothing about landing. But we figured uh, sending one ton of payload on a flyby mission to Mars is not particularly interesting. So we looked into how we can actually slow down the spacecraft once it gets where it needs to be. And uh, well, it's complicated as you can see here. Uh, the relative velocity of the spacecraft uh, to Mars is 15.4 kilometers per second. This is, uh, this is huge. Um, that's not what we typically see in Mars missions. And the minimum delta V you would require to actually capture that spacecraft is about 12 kilometers per second. Now, there is no laser array on Mars um, and there won't be for a while. So how do we actually slow down? 
you can't use an alternate means of propulsion. You can't put chemical propulsion on it. Uh, in fact, if you can think of any propulsion system that can deliver this amount of delta V that isn't a laser array um, that we could put on this payload to slow it down once it gets there, well, then that defeats the purpose of using a laser array in the first place, right? If you have this magical propulsion system, then why not use it to depart? So we figured there is no practical, realistic way uh, to slow down with a propulsion system at Mars. The only option we have is to aerobrake, to do an air capture maneuver. So we use the Martian atmosphere to uh, dissipate our energy and to actually send us on a, a captured orbit. So uh, the idea is that we'd, we'd be coming in really quickly, really fast into the Mars atmosphere. We would skim it. If we don't spend enough time in there, or if we don't touch the atmosphere, or if we miss it, well, we shoot off back into interplanetary space, never to be seen again. Uh, so we want to avoid that. What we really want is we want to stay in the atmosphere long enough dissipate enough energy to actually stay within a closed orbit around Mars. And then once that's done, okay, we can do another pass and, and land. Um, but that's, that's difficult. Um, just landing at Mars for regular missions is already a very difficult task. Um, and here it's, it's even more delicate. Uh, but we looked at how we would actually achieve this and we found that just relying on, on simple drag um, on the spacecraft was not sufficient. Um, so I'm just going to take the time to explain this diagram. We've got Mars at the bottom. We've got our spacecraft here. There are three forces acting on it. Mostly there is the weight of the spacecraft. There is the drag due to the atmosphere. Um, and then there is a lift force that we can apply if we want. Uh, and it's traveling this way. So yeah, as I said, drag alone is not really enough to actually slow us down and capture our, our payload in, in Mars orbit. So what we considered was what if we used lift pointed towards the planet to force the spacecraft to stay within the atmosphere for as long as possible to actually dissipate all the energy we need. This is great both to dissipate more energy and also to dissipate it over a longer period of time so that we can reduce the peak heat fluxes on the capsule, we can reduce the peak G loads on the capsule, and we make a reentry that's more survivable. Um, yeah, there's a question: combination of error breaking and deployable light sail or orbital for orbital capture. Um, I'm not sure, especially with the kind of payload sizes we're looking at. I'm not sure a light sail would be enough to slow down the spacecraft, even if you used it early on in the trajectory. Um, or if you did, you would increase your transit time. Uh, and so that would also defeat the, the purpose of the mission. So unfortunately, I mean, so you can add balloons, you can add a lot of different error breaking systems on the payload itself to increase your, your drag coefficient and control it. And, and that could actually uh, be helpful. So another question about using reverse thrust. Well, if we add the thrust to actually slow down our spacecraft enough at Mars, then we wouldn't need a laser array in the first place to get to Mars in 45 days, right? Because the delta V required, uh, remember, is, is still quite high, right? We're 12 kilometers to slow down and we needed 14 to accelerate. So um, if you can find a, thruster that can deliver you this 12 kilometers per second to slow down, then you wouldn't need it to actually leave. Um, you wouldn't need a laser array to, to do any of this. Um, what we did find was that um, we could manage, we could keep G loads on certain trajectory to under eight Gs, which is survivable. It's even fun apparently for some people. Um, and we can also uh, reduce heat fluxes to the capsule to levels that you know, are, are quite high compared to any other mission we've sent there, but still manageable, especially for uh, reentry systems 
uh, under development at the moment at NASA. Uh, there are a few deployable systems that can are capable of, of handling the heat fluxes uh, to the capsule that we've seen here. So we can slow down, we can do this mission, we can do this 45 day transit to Mars. Uh, the next question we had was, well, what else can we do, right? Uh, and first of all, we can do uh, other types of missions to Mars. We can do, uh, we can look at crewed missions, right? So right now we just looked at a one ton mission. That's not enough to actually put a human on board. Uh, but if you increase say your capacity to 40 tons, which is the mass of the Orion capsule, its service module and some more, uh, you could actually send that with a four gigawatt array. Um, you would need a lot of propellant, of course, but that's a, a feasible uh, mission with the system. We also looked at, well, okay, um, how do we, what if we don't want to have the, the speed of that rapid transit, but we want to maximize our capacity? Uh, and in that case, that's also something that laser thermal can do. Um, we took for comparison a Centaur uh, cryogenic upper stage that you see here on the right. Uh, we took the amount of propellant it could take. And we said, okay, what if our laser system, laser thermal system had this much propellant, how much payload could it deliver to Mars? And the answer is 120 to 130 tons with a six month transit. That's 10 times the amount of payload that a Centaur can actually deliver with the same amount of propellant. And this is done with a three gigawatt array. So even then we're doing really useful missions to Mars uh, with arrays that are still a hundred times smaller and less powerful than uh, the interstellar flight missions. And beyond Mars, well, there's still plenty of other things we can do. Now that we have a system with this kind of specific impulse, we can actually send missions all over the solar system. We can send direct transfers to Jupiter, to Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. We don't have to rely on uh, gravity assists that, you know, on literally, we don't have to wait for the planets to line up to do our gravity assists and, and do missions that take decades to reach their destination. We can send them directly where they need to be. Uh, we can also send interstellar precursor missions. So just like Voyager, send out missions to the edges of the solar system to visit places such as the solar gravitational focus. It's a location away from the sun where we can actually use the sun as a lens to image exoplanets and get, uh, you know, uh, megapixel resolution images of exoplanets. So that that's really the promise of, of such a propulsion system. Okay, I think uh, it's about time. I'd like to thank you for uh, listening. I'd like to thank my collaborators as well, uh, Zofan Bao, Sebastian Rodriguez Rosero, Arnav Sinha, Professor Higgins, uh, who have co-authored this paper with me. And I'd like to thank uh, other students who have worked over the summer on this project uh, that really have made this possible. Thank you. Uh, very exciting and, and thank you. Manuel and uh, Professor Higgins. Uh, uh, it's impressive research and study and congratulations. Yes. Thanks. You can have a, an open dialogue conversation. Feel free to ask questions. Yes. So I guess I'll take the question in the chat already. Well, there was your question on um, on increasing laser pointing accuracy. Uh, that's definitely a challenge with the laser array. Um, there are si there are similar challenges to the one experienced by the, the breakthrough Starshot concept. And so where we are quite relying a lot on, on the work they've done to basically say, okay, that shouldn't be uh, as big of an issue, but it's definitely something that to be worked on. Uh, one thing that would definitely need to be present on a laser thermal propulsion system is some sort of beacon to uh, assist in, in pointing the laser array in the right direction. Um, not having any way, having a non-cooperating target uh, in these, these scenarios uh, makes pointing, pointing accuracy a very big challenge. 
uh, any possibility of drawing attention of extraterrestrials by using the lasers? <laughs> yeah, I can. Maybe I can. I can take. Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, so that's uh, issue has come up a few times in connection with using lasers for the interstellar probe. Um, in fact, Professor Avi Loeb at Harvard has speculated that we should be looking for other civilizations break through star shots. We should be looking for laser flashes as, as different mission, uh, you know, other other intelligences in our galaxy might be doing missions. So that's that's been explored. Um, that's a good thing for astronomers and astrophysicists to worry about. So we mechanical engineers don't worry about that issue too much. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I would say maybe look at Avi Loeb's papers, and I think Philip Lubin as well has, has looked into this issue. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a uh, trendy area now in, in SETI uh, called looking for techno signatures. So, you know, can we detect the evidence of technology of other other civilizations? And uh, it's quite a quite a high level of science now. They really, you know, crunch the numbers and think about how far away could you see another laser like this. So as I recall, the, the breakthrough star shot laser would easily be able to send a signal that would be, you know, visible on the other side of our galaxy. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's possible we could be could be saying hello to the extraterrestrials, but you know we've been saying hello for almost a century now with our television and radio broadcasts. So uh, the signals are weaker, but if there's civilizations out there, they're probably smarter. They have better technology, and they'll be picking up those signals anyway. Okay, there's another question uh, on the power to weight ratio of the engine. That's a very good question. Uh, in fact, our whole mission and, and spacecraft design was centered around achieving the lowest power to weight ratio possible, right? The lowest, um, there's this, this parameter called uh, alpha used in electrical propulsion systems, uh, which is actually very important actually in this mission design. Uh, the alpha parameter uh, that you see here is a measure of the mass of your propulsion system divided by the, the power of your propulsion system. So in our case, we have a power of 100 megawatts, and we're trying to reduce our propulsion system mass to as low as possible. Uh, typically, uh, this parameter is hovering at, uh, I'd say, I think 10 kilograms per kilowatt, unless I'm wrong, currently for, for electric propulsion system. Um, and really what, what would really enable interplanetary missions would be lowering this alpha parameter to less than one kilogram per kilowatt and uh, you know, 0.1, 0.01, that's, that's even better. And what we've seen is this combination of a lightweight um, inflatable reflector and super light tanks uh, out of composites, uh, our thrust chamber design, we looked at key components of the spacecraft, but we didn't consider every single auxiliary subsystem. So it's, it's still a very preliminary mass estimate, but we've been able to, uh, to achieve an alpha parameter, a power to weight ratio of 0 0.0015 kilograms per kilowatt in the design that I've presented here. Um, now, if you have any questions about this slide, that this, this goes into a whole discussion about specific impulse optimization. Uh, but what we find is that based on, uh, on optimizing for the power system mass, uh, the specific impulse of your system, the power input, and the time of your mission, of your, your burn maneuver, uh, there is an optimal specific impulse for your, your system uh, given a certain power to weight ratio. And we're seeing here, see this line for 3,000 seconds of ISP. Um, we see that it's the optimal specific impulse for a 0 0.005 kilogram per kilowatt uh, propulsion system, which is great for us in a way. It means that we can still increase the mass of the system, you know, uh, by, by five, by factor five, by even a factor 10, and it would still be a very competitive propulsion system compared to what we have today. Okay. Now maybe we can just keep tag teaming here, Emmanuel, on the, on yeah. the questions. So um, I see AC ask a question here about the, the geopolitical implications of building 100 megawatt or eventually gigawatt class lasers. So yes, that's a concern. Um, 
to be clear, this laser would probably be built, you know, on a mountaintop someplace, you know, the, the, the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is where a lot of astronomy is done these days, would be a very desirable place or, you know, maybe a mountaintop in, in a island in the Pacific or something. Um, you know, it's a fixed installation, so it can't, uh, you know, it can probably only shoot in a narrow region, you know, near the, the zenith of the sky. So it's not that flexible as a weapon system, but it, it is an implication. But it's really, if, if you want to eventually go to the stars, it's, you can't really get away from this. So our, as Emmanuel said at the beginning, our group here at McGill, we're really devoted to developing technologies that will eventually get us to the stars. And there's a quote, I, I used to always attribute this to, uh, to Jeff Landis at, at NASA Glenn, who's done a lot of work on interstellar flight, who said that any interstellar propulsion technology is indistinguishable from a from a from a weapon. Okay, it turns out I was recently collected uh, corrected on this. It was actually the science fiction writer Larry Niven who 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 worked this into his 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 novel Ringworld, which I think goes back to 1970. Uh, similar concept. So any any kind of space drive is going to have to have energy densities uh, sufficient to, to, to be able to use as a weapon. You know, if you had a, even a warp drive, well, you, you could use that warp drive to accelerate away from the earth and then turn around and come back and hit the earth at a significant fraction of the speed of light and, and do a huge amount of damage. So yeah, that's, that's a concern. Uh, I think the, the best thing is to probably, you know, make sure that the, the laser is a fixed installation, can only point at kind of one spot in the sky uh, we, we right now fire lasers into the sky. Astronomers do this as guide stars. And there's actually a, like a central clearinghouse where it's, it's it, you know, they, they check to make sure there's no satellites in the, in the path where the laser is going to fire it. So we need some kind of, you know, international regimen to, 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 to uh, uh, make sure that the laser is used in a, in a safe way. And then uh, Trevor, yeah, Trevor, great. Thanks for joining us. Glad you're here. Um, the laser operates at a wavelength of about one micron, and the Earth's atmosphere is pretty much transparent at that wavelength. So really minuscule amount of power is lost uh, when, the, when the laser passes through the atmosphere. Uh, again, we probably do this on a, on a mountaintop, so uh, no, no birds or anything will hopefully pass through the beam. Uh, yeah, interestingly, the, the, the even bigger laser that they talk about building for breakthrough star shot that is 100 gigawatts, Again, that 100 gigawatts would be spread over like a, a very large array. Uh, the, the Breakthrough Starshot laser would be about 10 kilometers in diameter. And that means the flux is relatively low. It's only about one kilowatt per square meter, which is about what sunlight is. So in, in principle, the Breakthrough Starshot laser, you could actually walk through the beam uh, when it's leaving Earth and, and you know, you'd, be, you'd be okay. I wouldn't recommend doing it, but it would be okay. And it's just infrared light. It's not gonna give you cancer or anything. It's not ultraviolet. Um, the laser that we came up with this and the design that Emmanuel presented, it is a little bit more intense. So it's 100 megawatts, but concentrated in just 10 square meters. So that you would not want to probably put your hand into the beam, uh, but it's comparable to the kind of laser beams that are sent through the atmosphere. You know, eventually we're going to be doing laser communication. Right now they're doing laser communication between satellites. You know, Starlink will be doing that. Eventually we'll be sending lasers through the atmosphere for communication. So it's kind of comparable to the laser fluxes there. Um, but it's not going to blow a hole in the atmosphere. It's not going to contribute to global warming. It's not, it's not anything scary, scary like that. Um, I wanted to jump in as well, uh, while we're on the topic of the lasers. Um, you, you know, what if we fired the laser on a celestial body or, or, or an asteroid? I imagine yep, that, that's, that's actually sort of how, how, how Phil Lubin got started in this. So he, uh, made this realization about, about 10 years ago that these uh, fiber optic lasers, these are lasers that have been developed for telecommunication. They're also used in laser machining, laser welding. The, the laser itself is made of fiber optic. Okay, so not just the fiber optic delivers the laser to your telecom customer or to your, uh, your, your laser welder. The, the actual laser is just made out of a loop of, of fiber optic and it's gotten very, very inexpensive because everything's gotten cheaper because they've spent billions of dollars in R&D on, on fiber optic telecommunication, which is how we're all meeting with each other this afternoon. Uh, and so he realized that these lasers are getting uh, more and more inexpensive and you can, you can combine them together in a phased array. So you can lock all the lasers together so all the, the laser waves come out coherently and they act as a single optical element. So you can build a giant laser but it won't be a monolithic laser like what Emmanuel talked about 
was considered in the 1870s, it would be built similar to the way that we build supercomputers now. So at, at McGill, where I'm at, or Delft, where Emmanuel's at, when we build supercomputers at universities, we don't build monolithic mainframes anymore. What we do is we buy NVIDIA graphics cards, and then we just stack them up, you know, stack up thousands of, of these blades, and you have a supercomputer. And that's similar to the idea here. You would just buy thousands, eventually millions, of these little fiber optic lasers, combine them all together, and then they would operate as a single single phased array. So Philip Lubin made this realization about 10 years ago, and his initial work was looking at asteroid defense. So we thought about, if you're interested in this, just uh, type D star, D hyphen star, and maybe Phil Lubin's name, and you'll find lots of material about this. He started thinking about, you could build a laser and use it to, to vaporize off a little bit of material from an asteroid, and, and, and if you had sufficient notice, you could slowly nudge that asteroid away from an Earth intercepting orbit to a, to a different orbit. And then he started thinking, what if you put that all that laser power onto a, onto a light sail? And that's what led to the, the Breakthrough Starshot initiative. But yeah, the idea of lasers for asteroid defense is still a very viable idea. And the other thing it would be useful for would be removing orbital debris. So this is an idea that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's using a laser to just, just ablate off a little bit of a, of a defunct satellite or a piece of space junk. And all you need to do is lower its orbit just a little bit. You know, you're not going to vaporize it. You're just going to puff off a little bit to bring its orbit down into the atmosphere. And that's enough then to have it burn up and, and re-enter. And on that, maybe I'll just to take one more question here about uh, Cohen's ask about, you know, small scale experiments, demos that can be done. So yeah, most of the work probably needs to be done with the laser. So right now we, we haven't built these giant phased arrays yet. Uh, we're, we're not working on that at McGill, but People are as part of the Breakthrough Star Shot. So Phil Lubin's group in Santa Barbara. There's a group at the Australian National University uh, that's that's working on it in Australia. There's several groups being funded by the Breakthrough Star Shot to look at this concept of phasing, phase locking lasers together, doing the atmosphere correction so that they can sort of take out the turbulence that's introduced by passing through the atmosphere, remove that. So a lot of good work is being done there, but right now it's all being done with you know one watt lasers or 10 watt lasers. Eventually, someone's going to need to scale up and really build a, an array like this. Uh, and, and then we can, you know, do quite a bit of interesting work in the lab. Uh, again, it would probably all be done, you know, underground or in a tunnel someplace. So nobody worries about, uh, you know, what, what the laser could be used for. And I think that would that would probably be the next next step. I don't know if it's worthwhile doing a, a space demonstration un, until we have a really powerful laser. People have talked about doing this, you know, there actually was an effort to do something like this over back at the end of the 90s. They were going to launch a, a, a solar sail into orbit and then actually beam it with microwaves to see if they could just give it a little bit of a nudge, just, just to prove that electromagnetic waves do carry momentum. But there's really no doubt about that. You know, we know the physics of that's going to work. But to get into the regime where we can start to do interesting missions, um, you really kind of need to get into the megawatts of power uh, to do anything, you know, just a good calculation to do is just think about what the power of a of a launch vehicle is. When a Falcon 9 lifts off, that's several gigawatts of chemical energy being released. And if you want to replace chemical propulsion with this more efficient, higher specific impulse laser propulsion, then you, you need, you know, minimum in the tens of megawatts to do anything interesting. Um, you know, maybe the lower hanging fruit would be first to look at using lasers for delivering power for just just electrical power. So that's actually what is funding a lot of uh, Phil Lubin's work now is, if we're gonna go back to the moon, we're gonna go to the south pole of the moon into these permanently shadowed craters where there's we know there's water ice. Um, how are you gonna get power down in those craters? They're really deep. Those craters are deeper than the Grand Canyon. They're perpetually shadowed. Uh, so you can't use the solar array. So this may be one of the early applications of laser power beaming is using lasers just onto uh, photovoltaics just to generate electricity for exploring those craters. So that, you know, that might be the, the next logical step to, to show we can send electrical, we can send power in the form of a laser and then dial up the laser greater and then we can start using it for propulsion. So, Emmanuel, you see any questions in the chat you want to take? Um, yeah, okay. So, well, there's a question from Christoph. That's my dad, full disclosure. Um, asking about how advanced the laser array technology is. So, so there's another one, a follow-up about 
other applications, which include space joint cleaning. We did cover that. Um, but as far as a time horizon for these laser arrays, um, hmm. I'm not actually quite sure about that one. I don't know about you, Professor. Yeah, probably comes down to funding. And, uh, you know, I think uh, if, if people are asking what they can do to help, uh, we're, we're open to that. Um, probably the, 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 well, let me ask, let me ask a question to the audience here. How many people do you think at NASA are working full time on adv really advanced concepts like this? I'm not talking about, can we make an ion engine that's 10% more efficient? I'm talking about who, how many people at NASA are working on really advanced, uh, ideas, uh, you know, thinking about how can we do missions to, like Emmanuel talked about the solar gravitational focus up to 550 AU. How can we do missions out deep into the interstellar medium? How can we do missions eventually to other, other solar systems? People are saying 20, 75, less than 50. Uh, the, the answer is full time, it's actually zero. There's, there's actually no one at NASA that works on really advanced ideas like this. So there is something called the NIAC, the NASA, NASA, NASA Initiative for Advanced Concepts, which everyone can apply to if you're in the US. So we're not eligible from Canada to apply for that. Um, but but that, uh, NIAC does fund people to work on concepts like this. But if you're a NASA engineer, a NASA scientist, you have to apply to, to NIAC just to get the funding to let you take off six months from your full-time day job at NASA to work on these kind of advanced concepts. So that, that's the only mechanism that NASA has, and it's a wonderful program. They do lots of cool work, uh, really interesting stuff, um, but they get hundreds of proposals and for propulsion, advanced propulsion, for example, this kind of work, they can fund maybe two or three a year, and it just funds for six months. There's a chance to go on to phase two, but they, they, they fund just very, very few of these. And I can, I can tell you that there's outstanding proposals submitted every year that just can't get funded. So probably the first thing to do is if if you're in the U.S., uh, you know, contact uh, your 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 government representatives and say why isn't NASA investing more in these really you know advanced concepts, really radical ideas that could totally change the game? Why is it that it seems like you know private companies are disrupting space flight and this breakthrough Starshot initiative is a is a dot com you know Silicon Valley a billionaire put up the money for this? It's not coming from NASA. So that might be a good question to ask. Uh, and then that might trickle back to a little bit more funding coming in to, to NASA to let maybe them have a few, you know, let perhaps a few NASA scientists and engineers work on this full time and maybe they can fund more people submitting proposals. And then if you're in Canada or you're in, in, in Europe, you know, there's really no one uh, in, in European Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, looking at this kind of stuff. Uh, if, if they are, they're probably doing it, you know, in the evenings and on the weekends. Uh, but there really isn't within our existing national space programs, there really isn't a, a big emphasis on looking at, you know, kind of disruptive technologies that will really open up the solar system to rapid transit, being able to go around in, in weeks and months instead of years and eventually getting to the stars. Yeah, as very well said, go ahead, Emmanuel. I mean, if you had something to follow up on that, but. I was, uh, that's where, just thinking, I kind of lean toward the um, commercial side and, and, and the uh, private industry to, to help really um, advance this concept further. And, and, you know, if there are any private companies out there interested, I think, a, a, you know, a, like a rough materials cost uh, for, and, and admission costs would definitely be helpful too. Yeah, I mean, maybe one thing I just encourage everybody to think about is, you know, right now it's it's very exciting. It's a it's going to be a wild west show in low Earth orbit for the next few years, uh, and and you know this is going to what already has kind of turned over the apple card. What's what's happened, um, and I, I would encourage people to not try to think too much about how to get to low Earth orbit. I don't think there's much there we can. We, we can compete with the with the big players now. So somebody mentioned spin launch in the in the chat there. So I'm very aware with uh, with what spin launch is doing. I've worked on similar concepts to that. I worked on my my graduate studies was on looking at gun launch to space. Could you just throw stuff into orbit rather than using rockets? Uh, so I've worked on that concept for for a decade or more. Uh, but but right now you know SpaceX is just 
hitting one ball out of the park after another. Uh, and and even if they were to fail, even if there turned out to be some some major development pro problem with with Starship, uh, doesn't look like there's any showstoppers so far. But even if there were, I'm I'm sure Rocket Labs and Blue Origin and Relativity and Fire and there's a lot of companies waiting in the wings there that will step in. Uh, so I would just start from the premise that that low Earth orbit is going to become highly accessible and going to be very inexpensive, uh, and it's going to be driven by by Starlink or whoever their competitors will be. And what I would think about is what's what's the next step? How can we really radically disrupt how we do missions around the solar system? And right now, just to follow up why NASA isn't investing too much in this is right now the, the science community is also doing excellent work. You know, we have all these rovers on Mars doing awesome science. We're gonna be sending motions to Venus, missions to Jupiter coming up, and they don't need advanced propulsion. Most of those missions use the RL-10 engine, which was designed and built in the 1950s it hasn't changed at all. It's the exact same engine that we use for the early mariners and pioneers and voyagers and Vikings. It's the same same propulsion. And the uh, planetary science community, I don't think they'll tell you this, but they actually like these long duration missions. They like it when it takes New Horizons 10 years to get to Pluto. For one reason, it gives them some job insurance. If you're on a mission like that, you know, you're kind of guaranteed you're going to have a job. They use that time to do a lot of planning. You know, and they're not twiddling their thumbs. They're doing the you know, more and more refined versions of how you know do the flybys and what kind of science they're going to do when they get there. And it's not really showing up in their decadal surveys. So that community, total respect. I mean, they do amazing science, but it's all driven by the science, by these decadal surveys. And when they do those surveys, they just sort of assume that we're going to use the technology we've been using for the last 50 years. And they don't really think about what science might be enabled by breakthroughs in propulsion. So that's you know kind of the, the meta message I, I'd ask Mars University to think about is if you have a new idea, uh, uh, you know, some kind of cool new space propulsion idea, you know, please do talk to me and, and everyone else. Um, but the way to sell it is I think is to show the science that it's going to enable. I, I, I don't know if a commercial entity, I don't know if there's a, a real profit motive, you know, to, right now to get to Mars in a month. Uh, I think we just, you know, I think Elon's going to build a city on Mars and then there'll be a motive to get there in a month to avoid the radiation exposure. Uh, but right now, I think for the, the, the money for these advanced concepts, it typically is going to come, have to come from a government. And, and the best way to get them to take it seriously is to let the science drive it, you know, because the science, it's impeccable. The rationale there is impeccable. And if we discover a, a planet nine or out at 500 astronomical units, or you want to go out to the solar gravitational focus and try to look back over the sun and use the sun as a lens to take a picture of an exoplanet, you know, those would, would be, would be disrupt, you know, uh, rewrite the textbooks kind of science. We need, we need these, new kinds of propulsion technology to get there. So I think that's the that's the message. Or so I just think I've spoken past an hour here, Cole. I don't know if we have to end this at some point. I'm happy to stay on and keep talking for a bit, but if you have to stop at some point, let me know. Yeah, I think we're approaching the hour here. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's very exciting and, and, and we can probably speak about this for <laughs> the next few hours as well. Um, but we, we look forward to, you know, exploring ways to help advance what you guys are doing. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I really, really appreciate this. And, uh, you know, uh, Emmanuel, I just want to maybe give a shout out to the couple of members of our team that were here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Arnab is here, Arnab Senya. So he, uh, he actually did, he and Sebastian did a lot of the astrodynamics work and um, re-entry work. At Mars, um, spent a long time just running simulations over and over again until they found something that worked, and we're very grateful for for that. Um, they've done really excellent work. Uh, I've been really impressed by them, so I've been really happy with uh, that they're they're still uh, here with us for this uh, presentation, and uh, yeah, really thankful that they were there. Uh, I think, I mean, I mentioned them earlier at the end of my presentation. There was. Uh, Jofan Bao, who is, I do not believe he's here. Uh, he was involved really in modeling uh, the actual physics of the uh, laser uh, supported combustion and the, everything that's going on inside of the thrust chamber. Uh, I myself, uh, you know, 
took care of the, the overall design and made sure everything was uh, all the all of our sub teams were actually working and and then and, and, and you know making progress um and i also focused on the heat transfer problem on the feed system um so cooling the the thrust chamber i see there's a few question about that uh but really quickly i'll answer them really quickly where we looked at a um expander cycle for those of you who are uh, knowledgeable about uh, rocket engine cycles uh, we're using we're just running the propellant through the nozzle at first through cooling channels um and then uh, expanding that free turbine to power a pump that actually runs the whole system then that coolant that cold propellant is injected back into the chamber using uh transpiration cool um and yeah so i, I was working on the thermodynamics of it all um and on the thrust chamber itself there was uh matthias Daruturu and lynn sheriff they were mentioned on my slide uh then we had samuel smockett uh working on the reflector on the you know temperature of the reflector on its structure and we had Rahul Atmanathan uh, who was working on the tank sizing and uh, tank design. I think that's everybody. Thanks so much and, and keep up the amazing work. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It, it was a pleasure. Yep, cool. That's great. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to put maybe I'll put my LinkedIn profile here in the in the chat. We're we're working actually. Emmanuel's been working on a website for our group for a couple of years yet. We just haven't been ready to uncage the beast. So we we will have a website up for our group soon. Uh, but maybe in the meantime, I can uh, I'll uh, I'll put my if I remember how to do this. I'll put my LinkedIn uh, profile here, and anyone's welcome to connect with me. And and keep uh, keep in touch with us. Okay, hope that worked. Awesome. One word. Yes. Could be hard to fathom the uh, that your your impact on on the planet Mars there. <laughs> It'll be a wild ride, yeah. Doing aero capture at at eight Gs and uh, just just skimming the surface. The idea is just to just to skim the curvature of the planet as 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 close as we can and not burn up and not not uh, squish squish our passengers too much. Uh, so that's kind of how it was done. We we in, in when we were working on this. We sort of just paper and pencil thought about how do we do this. So we realized we need to generate a little bit of lift and point the lift vector down. So we're not actually generating lift to stay up in the air like an aircraft. You're, you're pointing lift down so that you can keep following the curvature of the planet. We're actually going faster than a circular orbit would be. So if you want to just skim over the surface of the planet, you have the lift vector pointed down and you just skim the atmosphere at the altitude where you're not going to burn up and the deceleration is not so great that you're you know, going to exceed eight or nine Gs. And, uh, and so we kind of pencil and paper came up with that solution. And then Arnab and Sebastian came in and did, you know, more resolved, uh, more, more detailed uh, three degree of freedom numerical simulations of the whole aero capture maneuver and looked, looked plausible. And there's new materials now that have, you know, NASA's developed that look like they can withstand the, uh, the heating. So it'll be a wild ride. Maybe people want to do it just for the thrill of riding in a plasma ball around, around Mars for five or six minutes while we're doing that aero capture. But uh, yeah, HGs is not that bad. You know, there's the, the Soyuz capsules when they do ballistic reentry. Sometimes Soyuz capsules uh, come in. They also use a lifting trajectory, but there can be malfunctions of that. I think it happened in 2008. There was a malfunction of a Soyuz capsule, and you know, an alert came on, and and Cyrillic, you know, ballistic starts flashing on the screen, and uh, it it comes straight in like a cannonball, and the Gs there are about eight eight Gs. And I just was looking at this, the, the early Mercury Redstone astronauts, so uh, Alan Shepard and, and Gus Grissom's flight, they went straight up and straight back down. They hit about 12 Gs when they, when they re-entered. So it actually is possible to, to survive a re-entry at that, that high a G loading.
everyone a fabulous weekend there and um, spring and summer. Okay, yeah, Phil, thanks for the great invitation. Thanks to everyone for all the great questions in the chat. And uh, yeah, Manuel did a, did a great job, you know, organizing the project and then giving a nice recap presentation here today. So glad we had a chance to do this. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it was a pleasure being here. But uh, I, I have to get to other things now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.